my talk is on progress and understanding the pathology of prostate cancer. The metastatic potential of any tumor is really the basic phenotype or the biologic aggressiveness times time, and we don't really reflect time very well in the prostate because we don't have good imaging modalities to really follow it. So we have to put a lot of emphasis on assessing the biologic aggressiveness of the tumor. And for a pathologist's role has been key in this because our ability to determine aggressiveness has really been based upon our ability to grade the cancer using the Gleason grading system, either on prostatectomy or on prostate biopsy. We also use things to determine the extent of disease, stage, for instance, and on biopsy, the percent core is positive. But when you're really looking at aggressiveness, there's really a fairly finite set of tools we have to use to predict how aggressive a particular prostate cancer is going to be. Histologic grade has historically been our key feature here. And some of these other things that show that the tumor is aggressive and can move beyond the prostate, which are fairly straightforward. And now we're starting to get into the age of molecular markers. And so I want to stop for a moment and really concentrate on these two areas today for the sake of time. Now here's the Gleason grading system, and I'm sure you're all tired of hearing about the Gleason grading system, but I need to put it back up here again because really we're moving away from the Gleason grading system, and that's the progress that's being made in this last year or so. What the Gleason grading system is is the degree of invasiveness and its morphologic resemblance to normal prostate. So when you look up here, you've got tumors that are made of asini with uh, well-differentiated cells lining them, and they've got this nice rounded border, meaning they're not very infiltrative. When you get all the way to Gleason pattern 5, you're not making glands anymore. You're just sheets and infiltrating cells. I feel that all of these cells are anarchists. They're all out for their own good, and everything in between. And as we know, the classic greeting, uh, Gleason grading system took into account the heterogeneity of prostate cancer that Gleason first discovered when he drew pictures like this. And he said, gee, these tumors sometimes have mixtures of this and this, and they actually behave somewhat in between the two. So he created the Gleason score, putting the most prevalent pattern and the second most prevalent pattern together. Then along came the ISUP, the International Society of Urologic Pathologists, of which I'm a member in 2005, and we started putting the evidence together to say, you know, where are we? What do these patterns really do in the way of predicting aggressiveness of tumor? And really came up with two modifications that kind of stirred things up. One was that grades one and two really shouldn't be used on biopsy because most of these things either weren't cancer at all when you had tools to look at them, or they got upgraded at the time of prostatectomy. So you got to be careful putting those on a biopsy. And the second one was on a biopsy, even small amounts of high-grade tumor should be recorded in the Gleason score, even if it isn't the prev most prevalent or second most prevalent. And there was data at the time to support this. Out of Johns Hopkins, we saw that if you look at cancers that are six or below, that have what we call a tertiary component of a high-grade pattern, even small, less than 5%, pattern 4 or 5, guess what? They did worse. They did about as bad as if you would have included those in the Gleason score to begin with. And also, if you took Gleason 7 tumors and they had just a little bit of pattern 5, they did worse. So little bits of bad uh, pattern, Gleason pattern are important. We actually knew this 15 years ago. Stamian McNeil actually looked and said, you know, it's not so much the Gleason score that is important for prognosis, it's how much of the tumor is pattern four or five, and even small amounts of tumor portend an increased risk of biochemical recurrence. And if you really look at large studies that have looked at survival data, this study almost 24,000 patients across five institutions looking at survival, and if you can say that you've got a Gleason six or below tumor, Gleason scores of two to six, that the survival is absolutely excellent, the black being uh, prostate cancer-specific mortality in the study, across no matter which age group that you're looking at. And that as you add progressively more pattern four and five, that's where the trouble starts. So here are three, four cancers, four, three cancers, and Gleason eight and above. And that's the issue here is it's the relative amount of those high-grade patterns that really influences prognosis here. And once again, in, in, in 2013, the Johns Hopkins folks really stopped and looked at this in almost 7,900 po uh, patients. They looked at Gleason grade and said, can we really show a, a number of different prognostic groups here? 
And again, if you look at the data, either on, when you're grading on biopsy or on prostatectomy, and you look at the data, you can group six and below together, and they do really quite well. And here, 95% plus will go on without any bio biochemical recurrence. And it's only as you add increasing amounts of those high-grade patterns that you start to stratify people into different prognostic categories. And here you can see the hazard ratios compared to Gleason 6 for adding progressively more Gleason pattern 4 or 5 on your biopsy. When we think about this, in the contemporary era, does it really make sense to continue to use a 2 to 10 grading system? And I'll show you why. We've all accepted it, and we understand what a Gleason 6 tumor, but from the patient's standpoint, it may be confusing. We know that Gleason 6 tumor has a favorable outcome. It's low-grade tumor. But if you look at it and show this to patients, Gleason 6 is halfway between Gleason 2 and Gleason 10. So it looks to the patient like they have an intermediate-grade tumor. And I think this contributes to a reluctance to choose active surveillance. I've talked to patients that says, six isn't so good, is it? Yeah, it's great. Oh, they didn't understand that. Gleason 2 to 5, rarely used today, and not prognostically different than six, as we've seen in those studies. So it's the amount of pattern 4 or 5 that's most important for prognosis. So it's been proposed by Epstein and colleagues that we do away with scoring and really look at prognostic groupings here. That Gleason 6 and below, that's the, the best, most favorable prognostic group that we have. Three fours would be the second, four threes would be the third, and then when we start to get into eights, that's the fourth, and nine and ten, bad tumors. And that these are the prognostic groups that we use them. So we had a meeting again. The ISUP met again November 1st in Chicago, and we looked at the data. We looked at Johns Hopkins data and also data from uh, the EAU, uh, multi-institutional data, and really looked at this. And we decided that this was the way to go. And we actually voted to adopt a five-tiered system with 90% consensus for those who were there. There were 85 of us there. And, and we also recommended that in these intermediate groups that because percent of four and five is so important that we actually record the percent of high-grade patterns be specified. So this is not out yet. The manuscript is in preparation. Stay tuned. It's coming out. And what I really see happening is we're going to start for a while using both Gleason score and a prognostic grade grouping just like this on our reports. And eventually, Gleason will fade away and we'll be left with a very simplistic one through five grade group that actually has some meaning. It doesn't take away the fact that there are limitations on needle biopsy. <clears throat> Cancer sampling on a needle biopsy is a function of tumor volume to prostate volume. The bigger the relative tumor to the prostate volume, the more likely you are to hit it with a needle. Similarly, sampling of the high-grade component is also a function of the volume of the high-grade component as it relates to prostate volume. So a very small little bit of poor cancer can be missed. So the biopsy may not sample the highest grade. And by way of illustration here, we do a lot of whole mount prostates in our institution, which we can three-dimensionally reconstruct. This is one of our three-dimensional reconstructions. This is actually one pulled at random from over 600 of these that we have in our library. And that's the whole mount representation. I'm going to take away everything that's benign so that you only see the tumor. And the fact is, the prostate cancer is a multifocal disease process. Here we have five separate tumor foci within this prostate. And all the different colors represent the heterogeny of grade that we see within there. And so this makes a difference. If we have a needle come in here, I happen to know that red is pattern three. Here we would have called this tumor a 3-3 three, three, uh, cancer. Here it hits red and green. Green's pattern four. This would have been called 3-4. And just a little bit over, we'd have missed the three all together, and we'd have called it 4-4. Four, four this gives you a different idea of the beast you're dealing with. And this does have consequences for the choice and potential effectiveness of expectant management, for instance. So now it comes up, can we improve our prognostic ability through the addition of molecular biomarkers? The aggressiveness of a tumor can always be taken back to the molecular level. And if we understand the molecular underpinnings of what make a tumor aggressive, then we can do better than just Gleason score. And here's where we're going to talk about molecular markers or biomarkers in here. These are associated with a potentially aggressive tumor. 
We want them to be independent of Gleason grade and readily available. So there's several on the market. In fact, we've had a boon in the last few years on molecular markers and prostate cancer. I'm only going to show a couple examples here. This is the so-called Prolaris test that looks at a cell cycle progression score. Looking at 30, it's a gene expression array, looking at the mRNA expression of 31 cells or genes associated with the cell cycle and as they relate to 15 normalized reference uh, uh, genes. And in their validation study on needle biopsy, looked at 300, almost 350 people in a cohort that was conservatively treated in England. And you can see the demographics here, median age. You can see the follow-up was very good. And here's the stratification of Gleason scores on their biopsies. The Prolera score was highly independently prognostic of mortality within that 10-year period. And in fact, when coupled with Gleason score and PSA, actually showed improved discriminative ability to predict mortality. And if you look at the prostatectomy data, this was just recently came out last year um, in a group of almost 600 patients here, that the Prolera score was independently pro predictive of biochemical recurrence. You can see the hazard ratio per unit increase in a Prolera score and also metastasis-free survival. So combining something like a Prolaris test with standard pathology gives you more information than either one alone. Another one that's come out, you heard about it this morning, so I won't get into it too much, the Oncotype DX, which looks at a 17-gene panel. You can see the genes here cross over multiple pathways associated with metastasis and death and prostate cancer, and importantly, can be uh, looked at on a needle biopsy and be predictive of advanced pathology, unfavorable features, regardless of where you biopsy the prostate. And that's an important uh, consideration here. And here you've seen this. Here are the risk groups, NCCN very low, low, and intermediate risk groups, and their likelihood of having favorable pathology is defined by 3 plus 4, or, and also organ-confined disease. And the Prolera score across each of these risk groups actually showed improved discriminative ability um, uh, across all of them for predicting favorable pathology. This is a more recent uh, study looking at, uh, again, another validation cohort. Uh, again, showed that the Prolaris, or excuse me, the uh, Oncotype DX and the GPS score per unit had very strong odds ratios for predicting adverse pathology at the time of, of radical prostatectomy. And the importance of this last one is that this was also found to hold up in racial minorities. This particular study had 20% of their uh, population was African American. You can see it held up and held up across a lot of little different clinical groups.